Hey, Thrilling Suspense fanatics. So we are going back to Lord Dunsany. Dunsany is an underappreciated gem who helped to establish a great deal of the fantasy genre by sheer power of invention. Uh, he can definitely be found in the work of Clark Ashton Smith. So with that said, we're going to read today... The Distressing Tale of Thagobrind the Jeweler and of the Doom that Befell Him When Thangobrind the Jeweler heard the ominous cough, he turned at once upon that narrow way. A thief was he, of very high repute, being patronized by the lofty and elect, for he stole nothing smaller than the Moomoo's egg, and in all his life stole only four kinds of stone— the ruby, the diamond, the emerald, and the sapphire. And, as jewelers go, his honesty was great. Now, there was a merchant prince who had come to Thangobrind, and had offered his daughter's soul for the diamond that is larger than the human head, and was to be found on the lap of the spider idol, Lolo, in his temple of Mungaling, for he had heard that Thangobrind was a thief to be trusted." Thangobrind oiled his body and slipped out of his shop and went secretly through byways and got as far as Snarp. Before anybody knew that he was out on business again or missed his sword from its place under the counter. Thence he moved only by night, hiding by day and rubbing the edges of his sword, which he called Mouse because it was swift and nimble. The jeweler had subtle methods of traveling. Nobody saw him cross the plains of Zid. Nobody saw him come to Mursk or Tlun. Oh, but he loved shadows. Once the moon peeping out unexpectedly from a tempest had betrayed an ordinary jeweler. Not so did it undo Thangobrind. The watchman only saw a crouching shape that snarled and laughed. "'Tis but a hyena,' they said. Once in the city of Ag, one of the guardians seized him, but Thangobrind was oiled and slipped from his hand. You scarcely heard his bare feet patter away. He knew that the merchant prince awaited his return, his little eyes open all night and glittering with greed. He knew how his daughter lay, chained up and screaming night and day. Ah, Thangobrind knew, and had he not been out on business, he had almost allowed himself one or two little laughs. But business was business, and the diamond that he sought still lay on the lap of Lolo, where it had been for the last two million years since Lolo created the world and gave unto it all things except that precious stone called Dead Man's Diamond. The jewel was often stolen, but it had a knack of coming back again to the lap of Flolo. Thangobrind knew this, but he was no common jeweler, and hoped to outwit Lolo, perceiving not the trend of ambition and lust, and that they are vanity. How nimbly he threaded his way through the pits of snood, now like a botanist, scrutinizing the ground, now like a dancer, leaping from crumbling edges. It was quite dark when he went by the towers of Tor, where archers shoot ivory arrows at strangers, lest any foreigner should alter their laws, which are bad, but not to be altered by mere aliens. At night they shoot by the sound of the stranger's feet. O oh, Thangobrind, Thangobrind was ever a jeweler like you. He dragged two stones behind him by long cords, and at these the archers shot. Tempting indeed was the snare that they set in Wath, the emeralds loose set in the city's gate, but Thangobrind discerned the golden cord that climbed the wall from each and the weights that would topple upon him if he touched one, and so he left them, though he left them weeping, and at last came to Theth. There all men worship Lolo, though they are willing to believe in other gods, as missionaries attest, but only as creatures of the chase for the hunting of Lolo, who wears their halos, so these people say, on golden hooks along his hunting belt. And from Theth he came to the city of Mung, and the temple of Mungaling, and entered and saw the spider idol Lolo, sitting there with the dead man's diamond glittering on his lap and looking for all the world like a full moon. 
but a full moon seen by a lunatic who had slept too long in its rays, for there was in Dead Man's Diamond a certain sinister look and a boding of things to happen that are better not mentioned here. The face of the spider idol was lit by that fatal gem. There was no other light. In spite of his shocking limbs and that demoniac body, his face was serene and apparently unconscious. A little fear came into the mind of Thangobrind the jeweler, a passing tremor, no more. Business was business, and he hoped for the best. Thangobrind offered honey to Lolo and prostrated himself before him. Oh, he was cunning. When the priests stole out of the darkness to lap up the honey, they were stretched senseless on the temple floor, for there was a drug in the honey that was offered to Hololo. And Thangobrind the jeweler picked Dead Man's diamond up and put it on his shoulder and trudged away from the shrine, and Hololo the spider idol said nothing at all, but he laughed softly as the jeweler shut the door. When the priests awoke out of the grip of the drug that was offered with the honey to Lolo, they rushed to a little secret room with an outlet on the stars and cast a horoscope of the thief. Something that they saw in the horoscope seemed to satisfy the priests. It was not like Thangobrind to go back by the road which he had come. No, he went by another road, even though it led to the narrow way, night house, and spider forest. The city of Mung went towering up behind him, balcony above balcony eclipsing half the stars as he trudged away with his diamond. He was not as easy as he trudged away, though when a soft pittering as of velvet feet arose behind him, he refused to acknowledge that it might be what he feared, yet the instincts of his trade told him that it is not well when any noise whatever follows a diamond by night and this was one of the largest that had ever come to him in the way of business. When he came to the narrow way that leads to Spider Forest, Dead Man's Diamond feeling cold and heavy, and the velvety footfall seeming fearfully close, the jeweler stopped and almost hesitated. He looked behind him. There was nothing there. He listened attentively. There was no sound now. Then he thought of the screams of the merchant prince's daughter, whose soul was the diamond's price, and smiled and went stoutly on. There watched him, apathetically, over the narrow way, that grim and dubious woman whose house is the night. Thangobrind, hearing no longer the sound of suspicious feet, felt easier now. He was all but come to the end of the narrow way when the woman listlessly uttered that ominous cough. The cough was too full of meaning to be disregarded. Thangobrind turned round and saw at once what he feared. The spider idol had not stayed at home. The jeweler put his diamond gently upon the ground and drew his sword called Mouse, and then began that famous fight upon the narrow way in which the grim old woman whose house was night seemed to take so little interest. To the spider idol you saw at once it was all a horrible joke. To the jeweler it was grim earnest. He fought and panted and was pushed back slowly along the narrow way. But he wounded Lolo all the while with terrible long gashes all over his deep, soft body till Mouse was slimy with blood. But at last the persistent laughter of Lolo was too much for the jeweler's nerves, and, once more wounding his demoniac foe, he sank aghast and exhausted by the door of the house called Night at the feet of the grim old woman, who, having uttered once that ominous cough, interfered no further with the course of events. And there carried Thangobrind the jeweler away those whose duty it was to the house where the two men hang, and, taking down from his hook the left hand one of the two, they put that venturous jeweler in his place, so that there fell on him the doom that he feared, as all men know, though it is so long since, and there abated somewhat the ire of the envious gods." and the only daughter of the merchant prince felt so little gratitude for this great deliverance that she took to respectability of a militant kind and became aggressively dull and called her home the english riviera and had platitudes worked and worsted upon her tea cosy and in the end never died 
but passed away at her residence. The End Off the top of my head, I don't think that we have specifically mentioned the Conte Cruel, but the Conte Cruel is based on an 1883 collection, according to Brian Stableford at least, in which something bad or gruesome happens with a, a dynamic twist at the end. There's a setup of death that we see delivered on. Now, some scholars are going to say that the supernatural story is of a different genre, and the Conte Cruel is, is more along the lines of the cask of Amontillado or another such story where there is that climactic ending. Clark Ashton Smith very much writes in the idiom of the Conte Cruel, at least according to Michael Moir, who's got some interesting weird fiction uh, essays that you can check out here on YouTube. And I think that Dunsany does as well. So I think the most direct analog we have to a Clark Ashton Smith story for this one is the tale of Satampra Zeros. And if you guys don't know, that is usually thought of as one of the very first sword and sorcery tales. In rough summary, and please skip if you don't want to, you know, hear something spoiled for you, two thieves go to a city and want to steal from an abandoned temple. Things go very wrong for them. It can kind of be seen as a reinterpolation of events from this story, given the even darker sort of macabre bent with which Clark Ashton Smith usually writes and tells stories. So anyways, I will be continuing to point out the similarities that I have observed between Dunsany's work and Clark Ashton Smith's as these Dunsanian tales continue right here on Thrilling Suspense Fantasy. So like, comment, subscribe, and I would be so pleased if one of you wonderful listeners would be so kind as to buy my work, Thrilling Suspense Fantasy Two volumes of comics and pulp in the classic tradition available in the links in the description box below. All right. With that, uh, take care and have a great rest of your day.